and welcome to today's episode of Workplace Equity Matters, a partnered effort between the Employee Rights Center and the Kim Center for Social Balance. I'm Dr. Heo Kim, Executive Director and Founder of the Kim Center, which is a nonprofit dedicated to nationally accelerating the achievement of equal status for all genders and races um, in the workplace through structured local effort. Alor? Hi, hi everybody. Uh, very welcome to this edition of uh, our, um, our, our monthly series, I should say, on the gender equity at work um, and the very many issues that come and arise out of it. Uh, we're very, very happy to have the very amazing panel that we have today that you all meet. But my job is just to say hello and to say that the Employer Rights Center that started in 1999 has learned many things through the years and many things have become very clear to us and one of those things um, is that you know gender equity is a basic, basic, you know, concept that we have to further up, uh, elevate, grow in all our workplaces to be able to, you know, have the kind of, you know, growth in in sort of vitality that we want in our in our communities in our work, and that's why we are fully committed to do this work, um, and to continue to have these public meetings. And I'm very happy to say that, you know, uh, Dr. Hale Kim is a great partner and together uh, we're uh, covering some of the most pressing issues um, regarding equal status in the workplace. And so we thank you for being here. Please come back next month and uh, give it right back to uh, uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are thrilled to have this partnership with ERC. So reaching fair levels of work success for marginalized groups is taking too long. Every additional decade it takes diminishes the prosperity of our society, our companies and our economy. So this show aims to raise awareness of what those who are most impacted by these issues need to achieve equal status and to increase the conversations with employers, civic leaders, and individuals about what solutions are currently in play and how we can all work together to accomplish what still needs to be done. The COVID-19 pandemic is making it glaringly obvious that marginalized business owners are economically vulnerable. We knew this, we know this even more now. At this point, women have lost more than half of the almost 10 million jobs that the US economy lost in the last year. Most were women of color. Two thirds of female entrepreneurs reported a drop in revenue. And in the first PPP loan round, mostly white business owners were served first while minority owners had to wait until the last few weeks of the program. There are a lot of factors that go into these numbers. Today, I'm honored and thrilled to have three industry leaders help us unpack some of this reality and advise us on how minority business owners can move towards success. I have Shreya Sasaki, uh, who is Chief Operating Officer at Mission Driven Finance. She has spent her career focused on the impact social conditions have on health and has a unique combination of skills in grant funded program implementation coupled with finance and operations. Thanks for being here, Shreya. We have Marcy Baer, who is President and Founder of Baer Financial Planning and Vice President with the Health, the Wealth Consulting Group. Um, as a certified financial planner, she's worked for more than 28 years with female executives, LGBTQ families, and progressive business owners to help them work toward their goals and pursue what's important to them. Welcome, Marcy. And Michelle Burkhart, who is the co-founder of Diversity Supplier Alliance, with over 35 years of experience in business, ranging from an on being an entrepreneur to a corporate regional vice president of sales, uh, Michelle supports small businesses, small business development through her business, through community involvement and her work in supplier diversity certification. Okay. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you all for being here. So my first question is for Shreya. 
Can you tell us why it's particularly challenging for minority business owners to succeed? Yeah, absolutely, Hale. And um, thank you for having us today and to all of you out on Facebook who have joined our session. So yes, can definitely start with, with answering that question. Um, broadly, I'll say that for Mission Driven Finance, we are an impact investing organization. And one of the beliefs that we hold at our company is that access to capital should be equal. And I think with what we're talking about today, that can help to contribute to the equal status of minorities, women, and, and other vulnerable populations in our community. So from that perspective of access to capital and, and what we see with small businesses and nonprofits, you know, what, what would come to us, a typical small business, you know, would be fairly new in terms of, you know, being past the startup phase. They've done their research and development. They have a solid product or service and they have a plan and they have a, a purchase order or contract to execute to grow their, their business, which is often minority led or, or women led. And they need access to capital and they may not wanna give up ownership. Um, they might have approached a traditional lender and were declined for a variety of reasons. Or they might have not approached a traditional lender because they think that they won't be approved. And there might be an inability to access friends and family capital. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities that I've identified um, in, in that story that are based on policies and practices from the past and you know, have led to maybe some attitudes being deeply rooted in our financial system. And so those policies and practices that continue to to make our financial system inequitable could include things like redlining that prohibited intergenerational wealth creation. Um, they could be predatory lending practices that vulnerable people have had to face. Um, and we also see that there's been a disproportionately high rate of interest um, rates that, that people are accustomed to sometimes when, when they're from a vulnerable population or they've been rejected. Um, sort of these things that we see that prohibit um, that equitable access to capital, you know, for small businesses and nonprofits. And unfortunately, um, to what Dr. Kim was saying earlier, it's magnified in this environment of COVID-19. And so what we look to do as a company and I think as a, as a society is how can we address these barriers and make uh, capital accessible and provide people the opportunity to get the capital they need so that they can grow their businesses, grow their jobs, and grow their community impact. And do you have a sense of she's, is he or a she, sorry, I miss her. <laughs> Alor, I think we, um, we, we're hearing your conversation. <laughs> there Hello? We go. Yeah, he put it on. Uh, there we go. go okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Shreya. Sorry about that. <laughs> Technology, right? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that broad perspective on uh, what the landscape looks like for some of these business owners. And Marcy, I know you were mentioning earlier um, some very specific obstacles that these business owners tend to face. Well, sometimes just like you were mentioning before, it's just um, maybe just not knowing where to go in the first place, like not being sure that not necessarily having a banking relationship. And that's why, uh, like you mentioned, Hale, that a lot of the, you know, large uh, corporations, uh, white male businesses got a lot of that PPP funding because they already had that relationship with the banker. And so as soon as it came on and the applications were open, they went straight to the bank. And they already had that that pipeline, that direct pipeline. And so, part of the conversation today is um, creating, you know, this sense of urgency for business owners, all business owners, to start that relationship with a a local person. But then, depending on where you go to try and secure some funding, as at this part of the presentation, we're really talking about funding, is really about what are some of those roadblocks. And some of them could be your credit score. Just frankly, your you know <laughs> what your credit score is. So the the lower your credit score, the higher the interest rate you're going to have to pay 
or maybe not even get funded at all, not even get approved. And so there's some cleanup things maybe that have to be done to get you um, ready and prepped for uh, submitting an application for a loan. And then there's other things that depending on the type of loan, uh, they want some security. So they might want some collateral from you. They also might want a life insurance policy on you to um, protect the bank in case you pass away and you, and you have this loan outstanding. And what happens if you can't secure that life insurance policy? What if your health is not in, in a place to do that? Sometimes they also want disability insurance policies. So there are some uh, additional barriers sometimes that are there that we just have to be aware of. But the best is to be able to give yourself some runway and some timing to be able to, um, again, get yourself ready for the bank. Um, and nobody knew this pandemic was going to come out of, you know, left field, right? A global pandemic that hits us. But we know as business owners, we always get something. We're always getting a left and a right coming at us, you know, and we don't know what it's going to be, but there's always hurdles that we need to go uh, through up and over. And so, uh, for minority business owners, women business owners, LGBTQ business owners, a lot of times those hurdles are bigger. And then if you happen to be a trifecta, you know, like a, a female LGBT, you know, minority woman of color, you know, then it's, yeah. <laughs> it may seem insurmountable, but we're here for you. We've got, we've got solutions for you uh, because there's a sweet spot. Uh, the timing is great that corporations, governments are looking to invest in these type of businesses more than ever um, based on um, kind of the sense of urgency that we had with social justice last year. So I think uh, while there was this big reckoning with regards to the financial crisis, there's also on the social justice side is hopefully some uh, more, you know, emphasis in that area to support more businesses. Definitely. Yeah. And, and Michelle, you were pointing out earlier too that LGBTQIA, those in that, in that community, uh, are often doubly impacted because they're not thought of as marginalized typically. Yes, definitely. I, I worked, uh, started a program to get uh, LGBTQ businesses uh, certified um, when I was working with the small business development centers as a consultant. And I saw all people of all um, economic backgrounds would come to the center, everybody uh, of different uh, racial backgrounds, um, backgrounds and the interesting thing with the LGBTQ is that we're a part of every background. I mean, we're 10% of every population. So one story was when the California Public Utilities Commission uh, was mandated by a law in uh, 2014, AB 1678 here in California, they were mandated to provide diversity supplier alliance uh, contracts to LGBT uh, businesses. They could get certified for the CPUC. And about a year or two later, uh, I was talking to a woman who was on the board of governors and I had asked her, okay, what is the mandated spend? You get a percentage like 3%, 5% or whatever. And she said, well, interestingly enough, we, we don't think that that community is economically disadvantaged. And I said, really? Uh, well, let me help you, you know, understand how we are. Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, she was thinking of the double income, you know, spending lots of money, I guess, at Prides or whatever. But essentially, we're not recognized on a federal level for contracting, mainly because we were discriminated on that level. And we almost were able to work with that on when Obama was in uh, in office, uh, but didn't get to that level. Um, we basically business um, contractors, you could subcontract to, a, to a, a, a prime contractor, but that prime contractor may have certain beliefs that would keep you from becoming because you are LGBT. So consequently you try and, and lead a double life in a, lot of, in a lot of ways. And and the other thing is that we're economically disadvantaged because a lot of the discrimination that we've had over the years. So the certification program with us began in 2005. And so you can see how how long it has taken for us to get recognition, but interestingly enough, we support the national economy with $1.7 trillion annually a year, and that's larger than the GDP of Russia. So you just have to bring those facts out, and so there are more opportunities opening up, but at this point, not at the federal level. Michelle, that's you're saying that, that $1.7 trillion is generated by the LGBTQ community? Yes, and, the, and we had a, a study done in 2016, and through the businesses, which can be as, as, as 
as high as $180 million businesses that have been around for almost 100 years. Um, and across the country, um, mm -hmm. contracting is usually what people think of with certification, but it's a wide variety of um, professions that are involved in certification, but that's the, that's the aggregate number through the business, through the connections and all that we contribute to the national economy. And that was in 2016. So I'm sure it's grown since then. So we are economically powerful, we're just not recognized and it's, it's not to the nation's advantage or a local or state. Uh, San Diego recognizes the economic impact of the LGBT community and um, through pride, through some of those uh, um, organization events that we have. But as a business owner, it's, it's very hard. And I was, I was lucky to be chosen to be the project manager through the SBDC which in the SBA sent a proposal to them to start having, broadening that whole uh, series of uh, economic development for LGBTQI people. That's really great. Um, it's really great work and it's an unbelievable, uh, not unbelievable actually, it's a remarkable uh, data point actually. Um, for example, there's, there's another one, women own a third of all privately held firms, but federal contracts go to, there's that federal element again, that, that challenging piece. Um, they go to barely more than, only slightly more than 5% of women owned small businesses. So you're talking about certifications. What, um, what can business owners do and what kind of mindsets do they need to understand as well about the value of getting certified? How will it help them? Right. Well, I, I think I was, as I was reading some of these notes, I was thinking the federal level is not the only way. Most of the time when people think about certification, they think immediately of government contracting. And it has expanded so rapidly and broadly that you now have the ability to uh, have certification that will help you on a local level. Like, for example, San Diego has small um, business emerging uh, businesses and small San Diego local all these anacronyms, but they have a plan, the airport has a plan, the Department of General Services in California cannot designate anything but small business and veteran owned business. They can't delineate with minorities per se, but they do have a wonderful support system that helps uh, very easy to get certified as a small business. Um, the CPUC, which is the California Public Utilities Commission, has again three certifications, a woman owned, LGBT owned and veteran owned. So it's a matter of knowing where you want to go and take your business. And you can be working in a, as a certified business on multiple levels. You can, you can, for example, be a second tiered subcontractor to a prime contractor. Uh, a lot, what I learned in the very beginning when I went to the very first session in 2005 on this, was that a, um, a representative from the Department of Indian Affairs, I think it was, he was saying a lot of the departments federally even have credit cards that give up to $2,500 or $3,000. If you're a small catering company that is starting and you're women to own, you can actually self-certify so you don't have to pay for the certification. As a woman to own business, you can start and start working your way up the tiered level uh, that way. Um, you can also, which is easier than being a prime contractor. The other avenue that's opened up tremendously is the corporate supplier diversity program. And that's where the procurement uh, section of any corporation has decided years ago that they were going to start working with supplier diversity. So they hired supplier diversity reps who would go out and identify businesses that were women-owned, minority-owned, uh, LGBT-owned, and, and start to make a relationship with them. Now, they're not the buyers, but they will start to know who you are. I think what scares people the most, especially on a small level, as well as a big level, I've worked with larger corporations that they just go, oh gosh, I've been in business too long, I don't really need it. Well, to me, it's like a, a general. You know, you have little stars on the epaulette, the more that you can acquire, the maybe gives you that little percentage up when it comes to a bidding situation. And say you're a woman-owned, LGBT-owned woman of color. You've got three different mandates of spending, and it may be that that corporation needs to have that particular um, division filled for them. So it really is kind of a game, a strategy in some ways, but it's no different than looking at a 
um, a new profit center for you. If you want to go along that, it's just another way that you can market. You really get it more targeted. Uh, and you can, as, if you're even a small business, I will say that a lot of certifications probably don't come for first year or startups. LGBT, we do have startup. And that's because they need to have a financial background. So when Sharia and Marcy were talking about getting your finances in order, that's the first thing I would recommend is I don't care how small you are, is get your QuickBooks or whatever accounting system in order and start to show that um, accounting because they wanna know that you're gonna be around. And that's one of the reasons that they want the financials done. And believe me, I have met up with companies that are 25, 35 years old and they didn't even know what their profit margin was. So don't be scared of the numbers. Uh, there's a workshop that I did that's called Where's My Cash? And that's really because a lot of people don't know where their cash is or how it comes or how to read the reports to get there. So going to a good banking or finance system or working with somebody like Marcy helps you get those numbers together so it strengthens your business from the beginning. So that's a little bit of a Big, but Michelle, also, <laughs> also um, the, sometimes people are scared um, to take on, a, a, to apply for a contract or take on a contract because they're a small business and they don't think that they could fulfill it. Right. And so I think, like, I've, I talked to a couple of uh, um, corporate supplier diversity people and they said, look, you know, we may be ordering, you know, 50,000 pens. But from this small business owner, we're only going to order, you know, 5,000, something that they can easily manage. And so they will have multiple business owners supplying that. Ultimately, they get the order that they need, but they'll break it up into small businesses that can, uh, can take care and of that. Even, even on the local, the local level of a government too. I mean, you may have a contractor that's a contracting contractor that gets a big contract with the government, but they're going to need an accountant. They're going to need, you know, catering. They're going to need a lot of support staff that you could then move into and be a subcontractor to them to fill, fill, fulfill that. And sometimes a prime contractor is required to have a small business number of small business subcontractors as well. So you have requirements on the supplier end and you've got requirements, you know, of yourself. But that's where there's so much support now to help small businesses become certified and go through how to become successful once you're certified. And if they're not certified, they're not gonna show up on the list to right. get these requests for proposals. Right, the other thing that we find that is overwhelming for people is, my gosh, there's so much paperwork. There is initially to get that done, this is one of the things that our company does, but it also is like any sales um, target market, you have to keep in touch with them, you have to, even if you don't bid on the job and a, and a uh, bid comes to you and you don't want to take it, you at least answer them and say, I'm sorry, we will not be bidding. You know, and that's that building that relationship that you would with any banking situation or whatever. You have to nurture it like you would any other target market. So much good information. And research shows that if you're there. making... <laughs> sorry? There's a lot of money out there waiting to be yeah, given to small business. That, that's the amazing thing to learn to, and yeah. to understand that no matter how small you are or how much of a minority business you may be, there's there's a niche for you somewhere. Yeah. There is money out there. And, and research shows that when you're trying to make widespread cultural transformation, everyone counts you and you need focused local action. Um, the Kim Center is developing a playbook tool that outlines goals and roles for every stakeholder group. So in companies, that means we create buy-ins from, buy from everyone, including the board to leadership to staff. In regions, that means we unite investors and government and employers, et cetera, around a common strategy. So Sherry, I'm gonna give you a chance here to jump in and talk about um, how you see community organizations working together to change the tide, to, to help those that, um, that need the help, that need the resources, whether in terms of just awareness or actual you know, practices um, and, and assistance. Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, thank you so much for that information on supplier <laughs> diversity. Just a quick side note. Um, something that Mission Driven Finance can help with is providing capital to those small businesses so they have the working capital right. to execute um, on those contracts. So 
Um, maybe offline we can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, to answer your question, you know, we see multiple things happening um, in the community, and I'll even put on you know, my hat as a board member at Catalyst of San Diego, which used to be San Diego Grant Makers. Um, through their impact investing initiative, we do have a collective group of impact-based lenders that are working to ensure access to capital for many minority, you know, and vulnerable population owned or led uh, businesses. And it spans the continuum from, you know, a micro loan, maybe through a CDFI, like in Acción or an IRC, all the way to, you know, some of our great partners like the CDC Small Business Finance. And, you know, in the middle, you have people like Mission Grown Finance, and, and we have groups like LISC in San Diego as well. So from that lens of impact investing and getting capital out into communities, you definitely have a, a lot of players, Self-Help Credit Union and some others come to mind as well um, to provide access to capital. And then some of the other things I think you've referenced and when we talk about some of the policies that Michelle and Marcy and I mentioned, right, either at a federal level, a state level, or, you know, a local level, um, the ability to have a seat at the table and to be involved in decision making is really critical. I was on a panel a few months ago, and one of the things we had going in the chat were, well, what if, you know, when they were making decisions on PPP, you had staff people and other leaders talking about the importance of how the information was going to be disseminated on PPP and how is it going to have culturally, you know, relevant and appropriate information to get to, you know, small businesses who wanted to access that. So I think with that community lens and thinking about the different sectors, you can have philanthropy, you can have government, you can have business, you can have investors, but also thinking about that policy advocacy lens and, and who are these decision makers and then how are those getting carried out and recognizing that sometimes, you know, there's just the attitudes that generation after generation have continued. And so we need to have those voices to really push back on, on some of those attitudes that then impact how these policies are implemented. And, you know, that's a long journey, policy change and things like that. They take a while. So at the same time, I think, you know, to Marcy and Michelle's point, like, Let's, you know, leverage our relationships, you know, at Mission Driven Finance, when PPP came out, our whole team was on the phone calling all the bankers we knew and connecting them with the small businesses that we work with and say, hey, you really should talk to so-and-so and, and just facilitating um, those connections so that opportunities would open up for things like that. So I think there's a lot happening in our community locally, and then I think there's, you know, a lot um, that we can do to continue to force some of the systems change as well. Yeah, and this group is San Diego based, but um, these types of resources and certainly um, the mindset exists in other regions throughout the country. So if you're looking for these types of resources, at least um, you may not know the name of the, the, the entity that delivers it, but at least you can Google <laughs> who does yeah. this particular type of thing, so. And that's um, a good point because there are certain certification levels. There's, there's a self-certification and then there's a third-party certification that you can get. And those third-party hmm. certifications may charge a fee for applying, but they also have nationwide networks. Hmm. So that also can give you a lot more uh, chances of connections and um, I know San Diego on the smaller level, the Economic Development Council has really started to really push small business and contracts for small business. Um, and, it, and, and it really shouldn't be scary because it's no different than any other bid if you're going to a corporate bid and you weren't certified or anything like that. People want to bid, that's just the American way. And um, so um, there's a lot of opportunity on all levels statewide as well. Yeah, and Michelle, can you talk um, more about your work with SBDC and what resources are available there? Yes, the SBDC is the Small Business Development Center, and they are a part of the Small Business Administration, which we do now have a woman that's going to be the head of that who is from California. 
Yay. Uh, it's very good. So love the connection. But what the Small Business Development Center did, and as an advisor, we had so many hours that we could work with the client. So it's limited, but it can at least start opening up your mind or give you some resources. It's a tremendous resource because there's a lot of resources and connected with, you know, like mission-driven finance and, and other community development, um, corporate um, Axion. But what it does is we try to sit down and, and work. We have, where they had startup as well as uh, mid-sized companies, a large company. I work with a large company that actually was coming out of um, Virginia and they had a branch out here. Uh, and we're trying to work in the, the with the military market. So it's all it, it's part of your tax dollars as work, as I would say. So it's no fee to you. Um, and you can go and you can talk with them. Uh, they have a lot of uh, trainings as well. And uh, they work with a lot of the different banks, the CDC, uh, Community Development Corporation, I think with Mission Driven Finance, those kind. And so they're all well connected. But it basically can, is a starting point if that's what you'd like, you know, want to do. In the, what we found, uh, they do some, some trainings and certification. And what uh, Diversity Supplier Alliance found was that a lot of the back end work, they didn't have a lot of hours to put into the actual how you get there. So that's where we would do some workshops for them. And we had four part workshops. So you not only got work certified, but you also knew what to do. You know, now that you're dressed up, where do you go? And how do you execute it? There are certain parameters when you are certified like a marketing capability statement that is conducive just to certified businesses. And that's how people, it's how the language is. You learn the language, I guess, is what I'm trying to say of being certified. So that's a great community re resource to start. And the SBDC has a thousand branches across the United States. So even if you move, there would be another, you know, I don't know how they were funded before, but I'm sure they're going to get a lot more funded again. Unfortunately, they went through four years of, of funding being cut. I don't know why, but um, I think that they'll start developing and, and get a lot more program <laughs> built up and together. Didn't make sense to me, <laughs> but uh, that's a great resource to start if you want to learn about the certification. Thank you. And, and for the you could just Google, like uh, like uh, Hale said, you know, use the Googler. <laughs> so you could just Google, um, like, uh, w what would somebody put in? SBDC or small business? There's four there's four branches. There's one that's run out of um um what is that university? Southwestern University in National City. There's a branch now, uh, there's a branch in North County, there's a technical branch at USD. So mainly the small business um San Diego Small Business Development Center. But if they were in a different state, what would they they would still just do SBDC? If you're in a different state, small business okay. development centers, then it would pop up. And, you and then the same thing for uh, for these banks and these um, community type based banks, like Sheree was talking about, same thing as socially responsible banks or um, community right. development banks, community something development like that. Banks. The community development banks is nice because it's kind of in between the smaller banks and the huge large ones like Wells Fargo that all say that they're really business oriented for small business and they do a lot for that, but it's harder for smaller businesses to really get loans from there. Right. But so, some of those larger uh, companies, larger banks will fund a CDFI. So, so these, these right. smaller community banks, I mean, they were started frankly because of all the redlining and because of the, you know, yeah. yeah uh, and, and all the, you know, bad banking, that was going on and not supporting lower income neighborhoods. Right. And so they created through the reinvestment act, these CDFI tape community banks, and they get their funding from the government and the SBA, but they also get funding from some of these larger um, banks, na national banks right. um, that have that division to be able to help the smaller business, the more um, in marginal communities. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and if you're listening yeah, and to us now, I, oh, I just wanted to invite our audience to uh, add qu questions to their chat, to the chat as we go. Um, I just have one more question for the group after Shreya, and uh, then we'll go into Q&A. 
Yeah, and I'm just going to quickly say um, groups like LISTS are national CDFI. So if you want to Google those, there you might have one of those in your community or just CDFI and the ones in your geographic area um, should come up as well. Mm -hmm. That stands for Community That's Development cool. Financial Institution, by the way. We're throwing out all these acronyms. <laughs> or you can also go to sba.gov and that will show you a lot of what's what's there for small business. And it has a tremendous resource there and, and, and you will probably see an SBDC in your area. So that would be the first step you could go to. And that's real easy to remember. <laughs> that's true. SBA. SBA.gov. Smallbusinessadministration.org. SBA.gov. Yeah. .gov. SBA.gov. Right. So it's sba.gov. Yes. Okay. I'm putting some uh, links into the chat here. Okay. Um, and if all else fails, I know we did this when the Kim Center was founded. We just Googled small business, San Diego. So the name of whatever your region is, help. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and lots no. of things came up. I mean, messenger and finance possible. came up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, in the timing is good. We talked about, you know, the stats that, you know, uh, women were overly uh, overwhelmed with the uh, responsibilities through this pandemic and yeah. this she session that's going on with women business owners um, and women in general, women out of the workforce. But then on the other hand is that there are a lot of businesses that do want to uh, support and right. the, uh, for, you know, gender lens, uh, investing and in, investing in women owned businesses or corporations that are uh, women led or women on the board of directors. The, the studies are showing that and this group doesn't need a study to show that that <laughs> women owned businesses make good uh, business decisions that those businesses, those corporations tend to have higher uh, returns with lower risk. And so it just makes great financial sense. It's not only the right thing to do, but it just makes good financial sense as well. And so whether you're an investor wanting to invest in those businesses or you're a business owner and needing some funding, now's yeah. the time. And, and there is a study that does show that women uh, CEOs of large 500, 500, Fortune 500 companies actually are more profitable. Mm -hmm. Right. Than, and than with less risk. I mean, both. Yeah. both. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> right. And when you and, start adding a um, you know a diverse work, workforce, mm -hmm. diverse board of directors, again, same thing. We start seeing that higher return and lower risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do want to address that risk piece because it's a common myth that women are risk averse. So, and and it's not true. No. It, uh, there was there have been studies that prove that women um, embrace risk just as much as men. But to clarify that risk point, they are more circumspect about their, their risk taking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and I'm just gonna put it that way <laughs> to be nice about it. So well, their, their risks are more calculated, which right. actually leads to, as you said, greater productivity, prosperity, and also right. resilience, particularly in times of crisis. Right. There was a woman on um, Good Morning America, they were talking about the $15 wage increase issue. And there were two small businesses that they interviewed. And the one that was owned by a, a woman in business said, you know, I thought about it and I actually did do it, but I was scared like everyone else. It has been the best thing I ever did. It is a better return on my investment as well as the community because people have more money to spend in the, my community. And right. that's exactly what women do. They realize that it's not just a narrow window. They, it, it really make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, and that segues into my next question, actually. Um, it was directed at Marcy, but I know you're all gonna jump in. <laughs> so how can people in the community at large influence change? Mm. Go. Well, I, I definitely would <laughs> love to start with that because it is all about being conscious of where you're putting your dollars. Where are you spending your money? So if you if you looked at your dollar bill, nobody has dollar bills anymore, but <laughs> you can see where your dollar bill actually went you know, throughout the day, and, and it's like on a magic carpet ride, mm. and going through, you can see where it stops off, and you go, oh my god, I didn't know I invested, like, my money yeah. there, or it was going <laughs> to support that, like, that yeah. is not me, like, that's not cool, I don't want my dollar, you're like, I'm trying to pull it back, <laughs> right, <laughs> and so if you really um, paid attention, and were conscious, again, of where you're going, just from shopping, um, and, and investing, that that all makes an impact. So your dollar, your investing, your spending makes an impact. It's either a positive impact or it's a negative impact. And so that could be towards the environmental 
you know, causes and sustainability, or it could be on social causes or, or good or bad corporate governance. So mm -hmm. in, in that area, you know, again, you're, you make a, a big impact either way, but if we can influence our dollars, spending dollars, as well as our investment dollars to support those companies that are in alignment with your values, mm -hmm. then not only are you um, doing a great thing, you're, you're really feeling good about where your money is, but you're also making a bigger impact. Right. Definitely. Shreya, um, I, know that, I mean, you guys subscribe to that philosophy as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would just amplify what Marcy said, right? Where you spend your individual dollars and looking to things as formal as a B Corp certification. You know, some businesses in San Diego County are certified by B Corp, which has standards on social and environmental impact. And so that's definitely one way and, and to Marcy's point, right, from thinking about even your investment dollars and mm -hmm. investing in know, companies through impact investing, through, you know, the different, you know, SRI screens, ESG screens that you can access. I mean, there's a, a variety of ways also through um, impact investing. And then, you know, I'll just amplify the earlier point too, right, around um, policies and practices and, you know, day-to-day -day interactions, thinking about who decision makers are and, and how we can influence them as well. Because right. if we're supporting those same companies, that are interested in supporting uh, minority businesses and women-owned and LGBT, then those large corporations also have more of an emphasis on these dollars and awarding these contracts that we've been talking about. They've got these corporate supplier diversity initiatives, and they want to put money into these um, small businesses to award them those contracts. And the more that we can uh, invest and support those companies, the better. Our company, Bear Financial Planning, that's what we, we specialize in this impact investing and this, you know, sustainable, responsible investing so that we're uh, all in alignment and supporting those companies that are doing good uh, for the right reasons. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with educating the public too. Yeah. You know, when you go in, you ask, you can ask them, do you use diversity vendors? Or did you realize that LGBT provides this much money to the economy. A lot of people don't know. And a lot of people are, are really kind of taken aback because they read just these big figures that, you know, diversity mean well, people just want to come in and, you know, get a handout. And that's so untrue. I mean, people work very, very hard. They're passionate on every level. Um, and especially I, what I've seen with my work with SBDC is the minority communities were very, very passionate about starting a business, being their own boss. How do they do it? And they wouldn't give up. I mean, yeah. They really just wanted a, 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 like say, a seat at the table. That's all they mm -hmm. want, mm -hmm. a seat at the table. Yeah. And that actually uh, brings to mind the common question, equity over equality. I mean, the Kim Center made a very conscious decision to promote workplace equity. And at first I thought, oh, it's completely different from the financial thing, don't get confused. But then um, it hit me in a conversation that it's actually the same thing because if you say equality then you're just throwing out these blanket opportunities whether people can take advantage of them or not but when you're taking when you're talking about equity you're actually talking about a difference making up that difference right you're working mm -hmm. up to that point of balance and that's what these certifications and um all that this assistance is doing. It's not, as you say, Michelle, it's not giving them a handout just for the sake of it. It's exactly. leveling that playing field. Exactly. And that's what certification was all about in the very beginning. Yeah. And it scared a lot of people thinking, you know, differently, but that's all yeah. it was. It's just, you know, you're either, what the saying is, you're either at the table or you're being eaten or something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> you're the lunch. Yeah. Well, but your yeah. stat that you said, uh, I think it was you, Michelle, or maybe it was uh, you, Hale. Is it something about the all the large corporate, you know, awards, those contracts, only 5%? Who said that? Goes to okay. women businesses? Yeah. 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 Federally owned. Um, yeah. So there's, a, there's, businesses. A, there's a, a lot of space yeah. there. <laughs> We got 95% to go. Like, and, like, we don't need a calculator to yeah. figure that one I think, out. There's a, there's I, a I think a lot things. of people still don't know what certification is and what contract mm -hmm. is. And so mm -hmm. they have this big thing as, oh my gosh, it's a big government thing and I will never be able to do it in, in this. But there's so many levels right. now where certification can come in and, and help yeah. you get 
you know, onto that air, the airport alone, the, the port authority in San Diego, right. all the different, at least I'm speaking for San Diego, but every city has a, a diversity supplier uh, within their local government. And they're yeah. trying to give um, uh, mandates for spending with small business. Right, right. And the upshot is, is these, these assistance mechanisms are helping you get what you deserve, mm -hmm. not, not, you know, just uh, as we were talking about, not just giving you a, a hand up, but it were, they're helping you, they're designed to help you get what you already deserve. Mm -hmm. You just shouldn't have to work harder than everybody else to get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to that social equity piece, Shreya, I actually have a question for you since you work with these, um, these small businesses, these new businesses so much, if minority business owners start to disappear from the entrepreneurial landscape, and that could be a very real thing with this, um, with the COVID phenomenon right now, what do you think might be some of the long-term cultural consequences of literally not seeing these types of businesses represented and people, business owners represented? Hmm. Yeah. And I guess I would flip that a little bit just from a strength-based perspective and like what we see um, in our pipeline and the businesses and nonprofits that are coming to mission-driven finance. We are seeing, you know, and we're, we're tracking that there is an increased um, percentage of, you know, um, BIPOC-led and owned uh, businesses that are coming through our pipeline. Um, and we want to support them and, and we want them to grow in the access capital because sometimes it's difficult based on those systemic policies and inequities we talked about earlier. Um, I think though to, you know, definitely, you know, think about that. I think, you know, the risk is some of the things we were talking about just from a wealth creation standpoint and with my background, right, in social determinants of health and things like that, when those economic opportunities are not there for our communities, either to grow from a workforce development and training standpoint, from employment, to be able to access quality jobs with benefits, and, and we can go on and on about the benefits of strong economic opportunity. The risk is when all of the things go away, we see what we're seeing right now, which is a deep, deep, you know, incidence and prevalence of COVID-19 and the impact that, you know, communities of color are facing. And COVID-19 is exacerbating pre-existing conditions that a lot of our populations face because of systemic disparities. So there's all of these connections, right, of why it's important to promote, invest, support, um, you know, our BIPOC-led uh, businesses. And, you know, we want to be a part of, of that solution. And, and quite frankly, just from like a product and services standpoint, when you have diverse businesses, when you have diversity on boards, when you have diverse executives, the quality of the product and the service also increases. So companies benefit as well um, from that diversity as well. It's like our the LGBT, the National Gay Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, they're our advocacy. And one thing that they just said is it, it's plain just good business. It's good business to have a diverse population and entrepreneurs and workers. I mean, it's just good business and it really is. And it, that's very simple, but it's true. <laughs> you reach so many, you connect with so many different populations that way that will then it will come back to your company tenfold. Because it is, you know, it is America and it is good business to have a wide representation on every level um, and the input. I mean, who started Google, for God's sake? I mean, when you think about it, a lot of, you know, it's, it's just very interesting. All up and down the chain, you know, whether yeah. it's a smaller business or a larger company or innovative or whatever. It's just, it really is just good business. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact is, the customer base is diverse. Like you said, this is right. America. So they're right. already out there. Right. You might as well serve them with people who understand them. <laughs> right. Our company should reflect the cities that we serve and the clients that we serve. And so yeah. you've got to have that diversity. Um, so like you said, not only for diversity of thought from a management position and a product development, but then also to reflect the 
community around you and have the uh, culture, you know, competence mm-hmm. with inside mm-hmm. uh, your company. Yeah, exactly. The, um, if you're listening to us now, please feel free to throw your uh, questions into the chat um, because I'm, I'm taking over with questions here, <laughs> but we want to hear from you. So please feel free. Sorry, Michelle, what were you going to say? Well, uh, the COVID with, with women especially has hit New York Times in their magazine had, our, had a four page article on the impact of women with the COVID. I mean, you're yeah. supposed to be there with the kids and teaching them and the mom and, and then doing a job. And it was amazing. But it was an honest representation of what is happening to their psyche, to their you know being, um, not to mention the ones that cannot work because they have to be home with children if they have children. Yep. Yeah, I just saw, uh, uh, Hale, you might've seen this um, because you're really data-driven, uh, but there was a scientific journal that I just saw, just came across my, my desk that I normally don't get, but it was a study also that showed that the female researchers, um, that, you know, so much lower um, uh, jobs that they got or, or you know, uh, research jobs that they got because they're, because they're out of the workforce. So they're, they've had all these other additional responsibilities now at home with all of the with the kids at home and not only the the chores you know all the household chores you know fell to them as well in addition to oh by the way you know now you got three kids that you gotta try and you know deal with their schooling schedule and and uh you know learning from home so well think about the impact of coming back into the workforce too right that's you're out for a couple a year or so which has been a year now and counting right well then of course you you have you'd be paid level you're you're always uh women are always behind every time they have to come back back, ping pong back and forth and take care of you know sandwich between kids and then their uh, you know their parents maybe that they're having to to care for as well so and I think the impact of getting things done, because women get things done. I mean, they really do. <laughs> get on top of all of that, still get things done. Get and things and done. they're still volunteering, you know. They're still, they're still out there helping with the cookie sales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In our last few minutes, I wonder if um, each of you wants to make a closing statement about, uh, well, let's end on a high note. <laughs> yes. About um, what... <clears throat> What, what the prospects are, what small minority um, business owners can, I mean, obviously we've been talking about what they can do, but just some positive statement, forward, forward-looking statement. Well, I'll start in terms of certification and I know we're all stuck at home or we're stuck in not this typical ways we go to build a business. So it is a perfect time to really take a look at certification and get your you know, application together little by little, but it's a great time because you're not pulled out by all these other networking things that you need to go to and you'll be ready when everything does open up to just jump out there. And you can also, like I said, that marketing capability statement, you can certainly put that together, get certified and start sending it out, whether, you know, and talking with people. But there are a lot of um, supplier diversity fairs online now and a lot of good education that I went to one and I got four contacts of people just wanting to connect with me from that. So there's a lot of opportunity too, if you wanna take the time to get it together. And I'd be happy to answer anybody's question. Um, I think my email's up there. so. If you have a particular question afterwards, give me an email. <laughs> yeah, and you can put it in the chat if, if you wouldn't mind right now. I yeah. could follow that because Michelle and her business partner, uh, Sue, helped me get certified. And so <laughs> I can say that the, the process, I did it on my own the first time. It wasn't that hard, um, but but I opted for having them help me the second time <laughs> and get me recertified. Um, so so they've got a checklist of all the documents that you need to have, whether I, I so I got the certification for a woman owned business and LGBTQ certified. And so there's some documents that you have to have in place that are going to you're going to need on both some some financials, your, you know, corporation documents, just basic business docs that you're going to have to have in place, regardless of the certification that you have, and then some different nuances like through the uh, NGLCC, the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce is the certifying body for the uh, LGBT certification, right? And so they're going to want something a little bit different. So I'm a certified, you know. Yeah, and um, in California, we're lucky because we can get certified uh, for no fee through the California Public Utilities Commission if you're LGBT. Right. And so I've already started receiving in my inbox, you know, my email box, 
uh, request for proposals on a variety of different, you know, projects. And so whether it applies directly to me or not, I get to see, here's all of the different types of, um, you know, requests that are out there for business owners that could take advantage of it. So yeah. I would say that's definitely, and like Michelle said, you're, you're at home, you're not doing that, you know, face-to-face -face networking. So now's yeah. the time to do this online networking and, right. um, and, and start getting familiar with how to answer these proposals or what would they want. So when one really lands in your, you know, inbox that you really want, you got all yeah. your ducks in a row and you're ready yeah. to go. Right. Shreya, last words? Yeah, of course, we are uh, excited at Mr. Finance to uh, be able to see more impact-based capital coming into our fund. And what that means is more availability of capital for small businesses and nonprofits in our geographic um, area. So definitely connect with us because we want to help our community, you know, driven businesses and nonprofits to get what they need. Um, to grow, especially as we slowly start to emerge um, out of the pandemic. Great. Yeah. Thank you all so much for thanks being for here us. and sharing your wisdom. And thanks to our audience for joining us for another episode of Workplace Equity Matters. I hope you like and share this post and tell us in the comments what industry or workplace equity matter you would like us to feature. We air every third Tuesday of the month at 2 p.m through Facebook Live. Join us on March 16th when we talk about the issues Native American women face in the workplace. Thank you all and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.